Russians are bold and Australian Russians gold. Are- I am, as always, your host, Christopher Paul Dugdell, M-E-D-M-A. We are Duncanville High School in these United States, and today is February 22nd, 2021. And on this date in history, in 1980, uh, the U.S. uh, hockey team, the U.S. Olympic hockey team, beat the Russian Olympic hockey team at the height of the Cold War. And uh, it was such a great moment in Olympic history. I think we all remember where we were on that day. Yeah, none of you were born. Still happened. Still pretty great. There's a movie called uh, Miracle. You should check it out. The Open Door Policy. This was created by John Hay. And uh, really, uh, he's basically just passing on the message of... uh, William McKinley, who was the President of the United States. And William McKinley made the statement that all nations could trade with China. Now, it should seem strange to you that he's able to make that kind of uh, decision since he's not in charge of China, but the rest of the world accepts the uh, what uh, McKinley says, except, of course, for the uh, Chinese. The Chinese were not big fans. They did not want foreigners on their land as it was. But uh, this was pretty popular with the rest of the world. Uh, The Boxer Rebellion. This starts in 1900. Uh, Chinese nationalists attacked foreign embassies in Beijing and killed over 200 people. Uh, Eventually, they were stopped by an international force that was led by the Americans. Uh, Now, the whole reason they did this is they did not want foreigners in their country, and we forced our way in. So then not only do we force our way in, but then we take our army in there, we stop them ourselves, and then we make them pay for the fact that they are putting down a rebellion led by them because they didn't want us over there in the first place. But we did make them pay $333 million for our intervention. It's pretty expensive. Maybe something happier and nicer is on the next slide. Nope. Uh... Japan's modernization. So uh, U.S. Commodore Matthew Perry arrives in Japan and forces Japan to open trade with the U.S. Whenever I say they force them to, we basically go in with our big guns blazing and aimed at them, and they realize, okay, we have nothing to do but this. Uh, There was some resentment, but what are they going to do? They're 8,000 miles away from us. It's not like they could ever attack us. See, Pearl Harbor. Uh, The Meiji Restoration. So Japan sees that it needs to do things to stay up with the rest of the world. So they begin to uh, modernize their industrial techniques. They also try and modernize education and military arts. They hire several former Civil War uh, veterans, uh, majors, generals, lieutenants, to instruct them on the new ways of fighting with the rest of the world. Now, Japan will beat China for dominance of Korea in 1894, 1895. Also, we've already talked about the Russo-Japanese War, where Japan defeats uh, Russia on land and on sea in the Battle of uh, Tashimi Strait. So, Japan had quickly moved into a dominant role as it began to modernize and uh, build a army similar to what the Americans built in the Civil War. And they'll continue to work and modernize their their military over the next 50 to 70 years. Now, not everyone was in favor of this, uh, such as J.A. Hobson. And uh, he thought that corporations should invest more in workers' wages and taking care of the people that work for them. And that governments would tax the wealth and redistribute it to the poor. And eventually this is going to be one of the things that Britain does with uh, inheritance taxes over the next several generations, you know, weakening the, weakening the hold of the nobility over the, uh, over the poor people in their countries. Now, Vladimir Lenin, who will later lead the uh, rebellion to take over uh, Russia, <coughs> he writes, uh, Imperialism, the highest stage in world capitalism. And in this, he describes all the major problems that exist as a result of capitalism and the fact that all these will lead to war. 
<laughs> Not COVID. Imperialism. Okay, so you have new powers coming in at this point. Uh, Japan and the U.S. would start to uh, get more and more possessions. Japan does in uh, China and Korea and, and moving through the uh, Pacific over close to where other countries uh, situated. The U.S. will get a lot of overseas possessions because of the Spanish-American War. Germany will also expand during this time. Uh, there were problems between uh, Russia and Britain over Persia. And Germany and France will fight over uh, Morocco in two separate wars. <clears throat> so, due to the, the major expansions done by European powers in Africa, it's starting to fall apart because it's hard to maintain all that territory. So, there's a process called decolonization. And uh, colonization is falling apart in Africa. And it'll take quite a while for it to completely fall apart. But this is during the early stages of this, right before the uh, dawn of World War I. And World War I will cause even more of this because countries' armies are uh, involved in fighting a global conflict and don't have the resources to maintain their imperial uh, status around the world. As we enter World War I. So militarism, okay? Uh, due to industrialism or industrialization, uh, nations started to build as many weapons, uh, guns, anything used for warfare as quickly and as quickly as possible. So Britain already had the most powerful navy in the world and had had it since 1588. So, and and they still have it until the end of World War One, and it's between World War One and World War Two that uh, that you start to see the. Uh, see the Americans catch up to the British. So for 350 years, uh, Britain had uh, dominance over uh, the rest of the world from a military standpoint, at least on the seas. What's that, baby? You still have some cheese? I do. I bought one. In fairies. I don't have that many crackers. Okay. You don't need cheese, Georgie. You're a doll, not a baby. <coughs> Okay, George, I need you to be a good boy because i got to keep doing this. Now, the rest of the world started to build up its navy as well, and a lot of this has to do with the uh, with a book written by Alfred Thayer Mahan called The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, where he shows over a 130-year period how Britain was able to maintain a massive empire because they had a navy that was able to control, uh, well, control the seas. So, Wilhelm II uh, of Germany, he was the German Kaiser. Uh, he, uh, he made Britain think that Germany was interested in all of their colonies. And so both sides will build these massive... In addition to building ships, they also built up their armies. Uh, over a 14-year uh, span... Most armies would increase anywhere from 50% to uh, 70%, with the exception of Britain, which actually reduced their army during that time period. Now, you also have two major alliances that come into play. And a lot of this starts from the fact that uh, Germany, Italy, and, uh, Germany and Italy were far behind the other countries. They were both relatively new. And uh, Austria-Hungary also wanted to expand, but they didn't have the territory of Britain, France, and Russia. Uh, Britain, France, and Russia were the three largest landed empires in the world. Now, so they form a secret alliance, and despite the fact they form a secret alliance, other people knew about it. Uh, so the first of these was called the Triple Alliance, and this was Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Italy. On the other side, you have the Triple Entente, and that's Britain, France, and Russia. But by building these two large uh, alliances, it was not going to be difficult for this to lead directly into war. Now, as far as nationalism, uh, after 1848, <coughs> there's a real push for a people to unite with people that are just like them. 
And as a result, people have real patriotism for their own people. It's not for their country, but it's more for their people. Uh, this is going to be one of the major causes of the uh, of World War One, and we're going to get to that here in just a minute. But right now, what we're doing is laying the stage for it. Uh, the map that you see on the left hand side are a bunch of stereotypes of uh, what people look like and the shape of the country that they're in. You see uh, Britain with uh, bad teeth and the bulldog of Ireland. Uh, you see France all discombobulated with a person being pushed in some strange form. Germany and Austria both have the uh, shape of a soldier with a gun. Uh, Italy has a very large nose which is offensive to Italians. Uh, the Ottoman Empire you see an old man. Uh, the Ottoman Empire was often referred to as the sick old man of Europe. Uh, you see Spain playing the uh, mandolin which is uh, partially describes how they aren't involved in any of the wars and Sweden as an old man which manages to avoid both World War I and World War II. You'll see that Switzerland really doesn't have any place in this and then you see some of the outlying countries in Eastern Europe including the big hairy Russian moving in from the uh, from the east. Now moving into this you have some major problems like the Moroccan uh, crisis. And this is really between France and Germany. Uh, Germany was really supporting uh, Moroccan independence and they were trying to see just how much uh, Britain and France were going to get involved in their alliance. And uh, Britain and Russia, even though they had nothing to do with what was going on in Morocco, uh, openly stated that Germany should not have any say-so or control over what happens in Morocco. And this is going to be something that strengthens the alliance between the the British and and the uh, French, and causes the Russian to join this group as well. But uh, again, this was just a test, and this is going to lead to some future problems here. Now, the Ottoman Empire again was seen as the old man of Europe, and so uh, there were a group of young people from from the Ottoman Empire. Uh, they were referred to as the Young Turks and these are Ottomans who were trying to induce reforms, uh, bring national citizenship, getting, getting rid of uh, religious hierarchies and legal inequality, but they all failed and the Ottoman Empire continued to, uh, to fumble and fall. In the Congress of Berlin uh, Bismarck is trying to balance the power in the Balkans. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with that region, that's in the uh, peninsula that Greece is on. I think most of you can probably spot that right next to Italy. That's called the Balkans. Uh, this did allow Austria to occupy Bosnia, uh, Herzegovina, and uh, this makes the Russians and the Serbs very unhappy. Again, World War I was basically a slippery slope and you know each one of these incidents is pushing closer towards a global war. Uh, the Bosnian crisis. So Austria-Hungary annexed Bosnia and this was a Slavic state in the Balkans. Again, a lot of the Slavs wanted to have their own nation so that they could, well, have their own nation, make their own laws and take care of their own people instead of being afterthoughts in other countries. Uh, but Germany's going to threaten war and support Austria. Italy is afraid that it's going to be drawn into a war. And so Italy is going to distance from the Triple Alliance as a result of this and ultimately once the war starts this is kind of the beginning of the fact that they're going to join the Triple Entente once the fighting starts. And the pan-Slavic movement is trying to unite all Slavic people. Okay, and most of the Slavic people are living in this, this area here. If you look at the map on the left, that's Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, uh, Serbia, um, Montenegro, Macedonia, and Albania. Uh, they had a lot of uh, commonalities between them. Uh, if you're a Mavs fan, Slovenia, that country at the top there on the map, that is where... Uh, Luka 
Doncic's run. So, a little bit of fun uh, Mavs information in the middle of a lesson, as we all dreamed and hoped. The First Balkan War. The smaller Balkan nations got together and formed what was called the Balkan League, and they attacked the Ottoman Empire. Okay. In the London Conference, Austria, Italy, and Germany are going to create Albania, and this is to prevent Russia and Serbian Serbians from accessing the uh, Adriatic Sea. The Adriatic Sea is right next to Italy, so on that side. Uh, the Second Balkan War w breaks out really before the First Balkan War is over, and Bulgaria, is tri Bulgaria tries to take Macedonia and is defeated by the Balkan League. So the Balkan League was doing pretty well at this time. But it's not going to last. Again, a lot of fights breaking out in Southern Europe, and most of these had been avoided for about 96 years. And so right now the concert of Europe that was formed right after Napoleon was removed from power is starting to fall apart. Uh, the Ajadir crisis in 1911. Uh, France is trying to take Morocco, but uh, Germany stopped them. And uh, they, they, Germany tries to take part of Morocco. And uh, so the Germans build a naval base in Ajadir, and the British thought that this would uh, threaten their naval security. Or not naval security, but naval supremacy. So France takes Morocco back as a protectorate with help from the British. And Germany was given instead of this prime territory that would be great for trading in the Mediterranean and uh, even with the Americas, and is given swampland in the French Congo. But this is going to push the Kaiser to not accept this kind of defeat again and will make things much more difficult in the future. Okay, so the war really is going to start as a result of what happens in Sarajevo. Uh, June the uh, 28th, 1914. And it only takes about a week before everyone's embroiled in, in, a, in a global... Uh, in a global conflict okay so and well actually before the global conflict starts and then about five weeks later the rest of the world is involved so it all starts because uh, Austro-Hungarian Archduke Franz Ferdinand now Archduke means that he was the prince and he was the next person to take over Austria-Hungary uh, the Kaiser didn't have any children of his own so he had to turn to his nephew he and his wife, uh, he and his wife Sophia, were in Sarajevo that day to talk to the people about uh, to talk to the people about some of the ways they were going to try and take care of them. Now, what the Serbs really wanted was they wanted to, instead of having a dual parliamentary system, a tri-parliamentarian uh, system where it would be Austria, it would be Hungary, and the Serbs, and they would also have a a certain level of uh, of self uh, self government. So, a group called Black Hand had accidentally found out that if they assassinated someone, they could achieve their political goals. So they got together a group of students, infuriated, on the streets of Sarajevo. And that day, Austro-Hungarian Archduke Franz Ferdinand passes in front of them four times. And on the fourth time, Gavrio Princip, a 19-year-old uh, kid, summons the courage to walk up to the car and kill both the Archduke and his wife. He then disappears into the crowd, and he will disappear, but he will eventually be arrested and brought back. On the top left hand, you can see the Archduke and his wife, about 20 minutes before they're assassinated, walking down the steps to get in their car. Uh, there's a dramatic reenactment of the uh, of the murder in a drawing on the bottom left hand side. On the top right hand side, you can see the uh, Austro-Hungarian uh, military bringing in uh, bringing in Gavrio Princip. Uh, there he is right there, bruised, beaten, and battered. And if you look at him, that is a hard 19. 
You know, if you look like that and you're 19, you've had a pretty hard life. He and all of the other conspirators were thrown into uh, jail, into dungeons, and he would die in a dungeon. They could not be executed, though, because they were all minors. M-I-N-O-R-S, not the kind that worked to pull ore out of the ground. And uh, he died of pneumonia in a prison during uh, the war. None of them had any idea that their actions were going to lead to the deaths of 10 million people and, you know, the maiming of about 7 million other people, many of which were never able to walk again or take care of themselves again. So anyway, this all starts in Sarajevo, and there's letters back and forth. Uh, they kind of call this the family affair because uh, the leader of Russia and the leader of... Uh, and the leader of Germany were writing letters back and forth. You had Wilhelm II and you had Nicholas II, but they're calling each other Willie and Nicky. Okay? So it seems very light, but it's anything but. Now, the Scheifen plan. Uh, this was a strategy that was designed by uh, a man by the name of Scheifen, a German. And the idea was they needed to beat France quickly and then they could turn to attack Russia because you don't want to fight a front on two sides. You never want to get in a fight with two people and say, hey, I'd like for one person to fight me from the front and the other person to punch me in the back of the head while I'm fighting the first person. It's just not a good strategy. So the idea was to invade France with a million men through Belgium. Now this would break the, uh, the agreement that said that Belgium would remain neutral, but... Germany is trying to win a war, not, you know, keep the peace. And once they invade Belgium, then Britain gets involved. Uh, the whole thought was, if you do this quick enough and take over France, before Russia can, you know, mobilize its troops, then you can end the uh, war rather quickly and move into to, uh, Russia that didn't have the supplies to fight a war against Germany especially whenever they didn't have anyone else to fight. This would have worked, except it didn't. But we'll get into that. Now, uh, the truth was all the information that was controlled coming to the Americas came from Great Britain. And Great Britain controlled the narrative in most of the world. One of the things that they did was they cut all of the uh, transatlantic cables that went from Germany to the rest of the world. Remember, there were cables that went from the United States to Britain under the Atlantic Ocean. And there were probably 30 or 40 lines that ran back and forth between the two. You know? I know that I sometimes don't have an extension cord that'll reach from my house to the back of my yard, but here they have cables that go all the way from New York to, uh, to London. So, a little bit ridiculous. So, since Britain controlled control this they reported all the news that they wanted in the way that they did and so the Germans broke into Belgium a, a country that was peaceful and you know they, they used violence but that's not what was reported to the rest of the world they came up with the worst stories they could think of so what were the Germans doing in, in Belgium by the way all this is false what I'm about to tell you well number one on the list was they were raping nuns you know horrible horrible story and made worse probably by the fact that these are people that had dedicated their lives to celibacy in a way of uh, practicing their religions and then the other thing they were doing was bayonetting babies it was said that they had a contest where Germans would grab babies by the ankles and then throw them up in the air as high as they could and then several Germans would get together underneath and try and catch them on their bayonets Horrible stories, and if they were true, some of the most deplorable behavior. But the way it was reported is, this is kind of what the, the German army was ordering. It's like, now that we have control of this, you guys go after the nuns, everyone else go after the babies. Even this image here that was used in the United States of a German dragging away a little girl who is going to be either brutally murdered or raped and murdered. That's the image that's being sent out to the rest of the world. And this moves into one of the major battles here, as the French will actually stop the German advance towards Paris. 
and the Battle of the Marne. Now, it was kind of a small turning point in the war because it stopped the German offensive and the Schieffen Plan. But this battle here would represent what happened all the way between Britain or between Germany and France, where the lines would not move for the better part of four years, and 300 miles of trenches would really stay stagnant until the end of 1918. So welcome everyone to World War and the Deaths of Millions. This leads us to the first day of World War I. I hope everyone's doing well. On the bright side, we'll be done with this in about two more days. So until then, don't, don't cocaine, don't AIDS, and don't COVID. Be safe. Wash your hands, and wash your ham also. Clean hams are good and healthy. Yum. See you in a few days.